how this new government works. The US and the EU did not break off relations with the new government. And Hamas said it's willing to negotiate with the US and the EU on the terms of the US and the EU negotiating position. For example, Hamas agreed we will accept as terms of negotiation recognizing Israel. We will accept those terms. At this point, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel got very, very angry. Why is the U.S., why is the European Union, why are they negotiating with a government that includes terrorists? And he was very angry because this was the second time Israel was being ignored. The first time was Israel, excuse me, the United States and the EU. They were negotiating with Iran. And Netanyahu said Iran is a terrorist state. The US and the EU ignored him, continued negotiations with Iran. Now, Israel says Hamas is a terrorist organization. The US and the European Union are negotiating with Hamas. So Netanyahu, the Israeli government, got very angry, but it couldn't do anything about its anger until the middle of June. In the middle of June, three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped and almost immediately, we learned later, they were almost immediately killed. And now, Mr. Netanyahu saw an opportunity. And the opportunity was, let's use the excuse, let's use the excuse of the kidnapping of the Israeli teenagers, let's use it as an excuse to attack Hamas. And if we keep attacking Hamas, finally Hamas will react to the attacks they will probably start firing their projectiles at Israel, and then we can say to the world, you see, we were right. They are a terrorist organization. So after the kidnapping of the three Israeli teenagers, even though the Israeli government knew, number one, they knew that the Hamas leadership, it did not order the kidnappings. It was not a decision of the Hamas leadership. And it knew, number two, it knew that the three Israeli teenagers were killed almost immediately. But the Israelis pretended, we are going to go on a search operation to find the teenagers, even though they knew the teenagers were dead. And they used the excuse of the search operation to kill several Palestinians in the West Bank, blow up several Palestinian homes, arrest 700 Palestinians, the majority being members of Hamas, and they kept pounding, hitting Hamas, waiting for a reaction. 
the reaction finally came, and then it turned into another Israeli attack on Gaza and another massive destruction. Some of you might remember that at the very beginning, at the very beginning, Israel did not launch an invasion of Gaza. It did not, because the Israeli government had a problem. The problem is this. If you launch a ground invasion, if you send troops into Gaza, if you launch a ground invasion, the only way to make sure a lot of Israeli soldiers are not killed the only way to make sure a lot of Israeli soldiers are not killed is you just destroy everything everywhere. That's how you make sure. If you destroy everything for a mile to your right, to your left, everything for a mile to your right, and everything in front of you for a mile, Nobody is going to get killed among the soldiers. And Israelis do not like to see soldiers get killed. So Netanyahu, the Israeli government, they knew the only way, the only way, it's nice how dictionaries <laughs> are used in Turkey. <laughs> Maybe one day they will be used while people are reading books. Um, they knew that in order for the Israeli population to support the invasion, you have to make sure a lot of Israeli soldiers are not killed. When a lot of soldiers are getting killed, the Israeli people, they begin to oppose the invasion. So the only way to make sure a lot of Israelis are not killed are with, by destroying everything in front of you and to the left and the right of you. But there was a problem. The problem was after what Israel did in 2008-9, Operation Cast Lead, which most of you remember, after 2008-9, the international community said, you cannot do that again. What you did in 2008-9, in 2008-9, they did destroy everything in sight. That's why at the end of our Operation Cast Lead, only six Israeli soldiers were killed by members of Hamas. Israel killed about 1,400 Palestinians during Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9. About 1,200 were civilians, but only six Israeli soldiers were killed by Palestinians. How did it happen that only six were killed? It's simple, because when Israel went in, it destroyed everything to the left, everything to the right, and everything in front. But after that, the international community said to Israel, you can't do it again. And now Israel had a problem. If it launched a ground invasion and didn't destroy everything in sight, did not, a lot of Israeli soldiers would get killed and Israelis would begin to oppose the war. If you go in and destroy everything in sight, you lose international support. The international community opposes you. So then the question is, what do you do? And Netanyahu, he holds back, he holds back, he holds back. He doesn't launch the ground invasion. 
But then, suddenly, he gets an opportunity. And the opportunity is when the Malaysian airliner is shot down over the Ukraine. How many people remember when the Malaysian airliner is shot down over the Ukraine? Raise your hand. OK. I did that to test how many of you understand my English. <laughs> <laughs> so the Malaysian airliner is shot down over the Ukraine. And now all the television cameras, which were on Gaza, all the television cameras are now on the Ukraine and the Malaysian airliner. And now Netanyahu realizes, I have an opportunity. Nobody is watching Gaza anymore, so it's my big chance to invade, destroy everything, defeat Hamas, because the international community will not be paying attention. So if you look at your calendar, or if you go back and check, you will see on the night of the day that the Malaysian airliner is shot down, on the night of that very same day, that's when uh, Israel launches its ground invasion. And once it launched the ground invasion, it began to do, on a very big scale, what it had already started doing right at the beginning of the war. The war begins July 8th. And already at the very beginning, Israel is targeting civilian buildings, targeting businesses. But after the ground invasion, they start targeting schools, mosques, hospitals, ambulances, power stations. Um, and they're targeting civilians who are running away from the destruction. By the end of the attack, about 2,200 Palestinians are killed. And the estimates are about 70 to 75 percent are civilians. Uh, about 1,500 Palestinian civilians were killed. 500 of them are children. And the damage to the infrastructure, the civilian uh, buildings, businesses, homes, uh, the damage is about a minimum, a minimum, probably much higher, but a minimum of $6 billion. The head of the International Committee of the Red Cross, he said, I have never seen such massive destruction ever before. I've never seen such massive destruction ever before. Uh, the world's leading authority on Gaza, on its economy, is a woman named Sarah Roy. She's a professor at Harvard University. She happens to be Jewish. And she is also the daughter of survivors of the Nazi Holocaust. And she devoted most of her adult life to studying the situation in Gaza and also living there for a substantial period of time. And she said, after the Israeli attack, I have never seen the kind of physical and psychological destruction that I see there today. I have never seen the kind of physical and psychological destruction that I see there today. Uh, that's actually a quite large statement because the history of Gaza is so, so, so terrible. I have never seen a place 
that has been the object, the target of so many what Israel calls operations. And I recently read a book called Gaza A History, written by a Frenchman. It's not a great book, in my opinion, but it even surprised me how many operations Israel has launched against Gaza. It must be in the last 10 years. It has to be, or the last 15 years. It has to be at least 10 major military operations against Gaza. I'm talking about not your shelling here, an attack here. I'm talking about major military operations. It has to be at least 10 in the last 15 years. So this last one, though, was on a much bigger scale. Sarah Roy wrote, the wounds, the wounds of this war could prove too severe to heal. That is, the people of Gaza will never recover from what happened in this last attack. In fact, most of what happened did not come as a surprise, but there were some things which were surprising. Um, it was not a surprise that the United States, throughout the attack, gave Israel a green light. Every day during the attack, it lasted about 51 days, every day the United States was asked what do you think about what's happening? And every day, the US gave the same response. They said, Israel has a right to self-defense. Even when human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, even when they were documenting during the attack that Israel was clearly committing war crimes. All the U.S. said every day was Israel has the right to self-defense. The fact is the attack on Gaza could not have happened without the U.S. support. Each time the U.S. said Israel has the right to self-defense, each time the U.S. was giving Israel the green light to continue the massacre in Gaza. On the other hand, it's also true to say that Gaza was more isolated than ever during this attack. In the Arab world, Egypt openly supported the Israeli attack on Gaza. Saudi Arabia openly supported the Israeli attack on Gaza. The Arab League only met once during the 51 days, and it met once to support the attack <coughs> on Gaza. So it was a disaster for the uh, people of Gaza this time, uh, unlike in the past. Turkey, which had given support to the people of Gaza in 2008-9, and then gave them support during what was called Operation Pillar of Defense in November 2012, this time Turkey did practically nothing. Uh, they were focused, obviously, on Syria, and they were focused on uh, the Kurdish issue. So Turkey was not actively supporting the people of Gaza, and elsewhere in the Arab world, for obvious reasons, 
There was also very little support for the people of Gaza because if you were Syrian or you were Libyan or if you were Iraqi or Yemeni, you had other things on your mind right now and Gaza was just not a big issue and so the people of Gaza were completely isolated except in the case of the Middle East the exceptions were Iran and Qatar, but they didn't do very much. Uh, the one unusual exception, because I met a few moments ago a PhD student who was focusing on Latin America, the one unusual exception was the Latin American countries. Uh, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, El Salvador, Chile, Peru, Uruguay, Venezuela. They all made very strong statements in support of the people of Gaza, which I think is to their uh, eternal credit. There was no motive of self-interest. They really did it from a genuine feeling of solidarity with the people who were being slaughtered. Uh, they showed more heart and more human concern than actually any of the governments in the Arab Muslim world for the people of Gaza. Uh, it was very impressive, but as a, as a practical matter, it didn't amount to very much. At the end, the people of Gaza were alone and they were abandoned. That was for Israel the good news. The Americans give them complete support. The Arab Muslim world is basically silent or indifferent. But there were things that happened which were not such good news for Israel. The first thing is uh, Hamas, the resistance movement in Gaza, it actually constructed a pretty impressive, a sophisticated tunnel system in Gaza. Uh, as you no doubt know, in the Arab world, 10 out of every 9 Arabs majors in civil engineering. And now you had in Gaza many, many unemployed civil engineers. And Gazans are extremely, at this point in time, they are very clever in turning nothing into something. It's true. They can find an, an automobile from 1920 and turn it into a very sophisticated computer. <laughs> and so now you have all of these unemployed civil engineers, very clever, and with very, very primitive technology, simple technology, you would be very surprised how they dug these tunnels because it was not just digging them, they had to dig them in such a way that the Israeli satellites cannot hear the digging. Yes. And they developed very simple but sophisticated technology, sometimes involving just a bicycle, um, to build a sophisticated tunnel system in Gaza. And as a result, the Israelis suffered many more military casualties than in the past, many more combatant deaths. I mentioned to you in 2008-9, six Israeli soldiers were killed by Hamas militants. 
this time the number was about 66. And the Israelis, they never actually invaded Gaza. They stayed about within two to three miles of the border. The reason they didn't actually invade is because Hamas had that tunnel system and they already suffered a large number of military casualties as compared to the past by just being on the border. So they didn't go deep inside Gaza. On the other hand, Israel's claim that it invaded Gaza in order to destroy what Israel called the terror tunnels. That claim was just a lie, and I will try to explain why. Israel said, we have to destroy these terror tunnels because these tunnels were dug under the border between Gaza and Israel, and Hamas wanted to go under the border and commit massacres against Israeli civilians. That's what they claimed. And that's why they call them terror tunnels. But is that true? In fact, Israel itself says, they say we destroyed 32 tunnels. Of those 32, 12 went under the border. So it's only 12. Now, let's use some common sense. Everybody here knows that under the current regime of uh, Sisi in Egypt, he too says there are all these tunnels going from Gaza to the Sinai, to the Egyptian Sinai, and that people are using these tunnels to kill many Egyptian soldiers. So what did Sisi do? I don't like Sisi. I think he's a monster. However, we should keep in mind what did he do? He built a big hole along the border in the Sinai on the Egyptian side. He never went into Gaza. He built a big hole on the Egyptian side, filled it with water, and flooded all the tunnels. Now, if you can eliminate the terror tunnels on the Egyptian side by building a moat, Anyone know what's, yeah, what's moat in Turkish? Hendek. Hendek. Okay, say it. Hendek. Hendek? Yes. By building a moat, Hendek, <laughs> on the Egyptian side, why couldn't Israel do the same thing on its side? We're talking about 12 tunnels. <clears throat> you just build a moat. Exactly what the Egyptians did. Why didn't they do it? The answer is simple, because they were not worried about the tunnels that go from Gaza to Israel. They were worried about the tunnels that were inside Gaza, because so long as Hamas had these tunnels, it made it very difficult for Israel to invade many Israeli soldiers would get killed. So they wanted to eliminate the tunnels, not the ones that went from Gaza to Israel. They wanted to eliminate the tunnels that were in Gaza so that the next time Israel invades, and of course it will because it does every couple of years, there won't be military casualties. When the international community says that Israel has the right to destroy the tunnels, 
basically what the international community is saying is, Israel has the right to make sure Gaza is defenseless the next time Israel attacks. Or the international community is saying that when Israel attacks, Gaza has no right to defend itself. Because that's the tunnels Israel was trying to destroy. It had nothing at all to do with the tunnels going from Gaza into Israel, which were very simple for Israel to destroy. Now, most of you also know that Israel claims that it had to attack Gaza because of what it called those Hamas rocket attacks. Well, were there Hamas rocket attacks? In fact, there were no Hamas rocket attacks. That is all a complete myth. It's a fiction. Some of you are wondering, well, that can't be. How could they have made that up? Even Hamas said, we're firing rockets at Israel. So how can what I'm saying be true? Well, let's test it using our common sense and the available information. What does our common sense and the available information tell us? First of all, for most of you, and for me, a rocket is something pretty big. And it's pretty scary. So, most of you and me, if this contained gunpowder, if it contained gunpowder, we wouldn't call it a rocket. We'd call it something the size of a soda can, which has gunpowder in it. Would you call it a rocket? No. It's just not a rocket. We can agree on that. Good. So far, we're making progress. Now, Israel claims that Hamas fired 4,000 rockets at Israel, which we can agree is a lot of rockets, 4,000. But then we're also told that the 4,000 rockets, they only succeeded in killing seven Israelis and causing only $15 million in property damage. So right away, that sounds kind of strange. 4,000 rockets with only seven civilians killed and only $15 million in property damage. If one rocket, if one rocket fell on this building, a real rocket, fell on this building, one rocket, that would be $15 million in property damage. So how could 4,000 only cost $15 million? Now Israel has its explanation. Everybody knows it. Its explanation is called Iron Dome. Yes. The anti-missile defense system. How many people have heard of Iron Dome? Raise your hand. Okay, so the numbers who are understanding me are going up. <laughs> so, they say the reason these 4,000 rockets caused so little death and damage is because, as we all know, all Israelis are geniuses, and they created this genius technology called Iron Dome. Okay? So let's test that proposition. Let's see if it works in the real world using common sense 
and basic facts. So, during Operation Cast Lead, during 2008-9, just to be sure, how do you say Operation Cast Lead in Turkish? So we know what we're talking about. You know what happened between December 27th and January 18th, 2008-9? Well, do you remember in 2008-9, when Israel attacked Gaza. Do people remember? Yes. No, 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 no. Do, do people remember when Israel attacked Gaza in 2008-9? Before the Mahdi Marmara. Yes. People remember, okay? During that attack, during that attack, Israel claimed, during that attack, Israel claimed they claimed that Hamas fired 1,000 rockets at Israel and there were three civilian casualties. They also said 15 million dollars in property damage. During the last Israeli attack, 4,000 rockets were fired, 7 civilian deaths, $15 million in property damage. Now, here's the important point. There was no and no iron dome. There was no anti-missile defense system. Iron dome was first used in 2012, and then again it was used in the past attack. Now Turks are supposed to be clever in mathematics because, because Muslims and Arabs are generally good in math and science, in particular, by the way. Muslim women, who are much stronger in math and science than Western women. It's an interesting question why uh, that's the case. I have my own theory, because Muslim fathers and Arab fathers, they tell their children, I don't care if you're a boy or a girl, you're going to be a civil engineer, and it's not be, <laughs> there's not going to be any argument about it. So Muslim women are not afraid of math. Western women are. Muslim women are not. Because their father said, you're going to be a civil engineer. I don't want to hear any other, I don't want to hear any arguments. So they do the math. In any case, that's a separate subject. Who can tell me if in 2014, if in 2014 there was no iron dome, if there was no iron dome, how many civilians would have been killed? Well, yes. It would only be, without Iron Dome, it would have been just four, four times as many rockets. It would be just 12 civilians killed. So the woman who said 12, 
who of course came up with the answer more quickly than the men. Um, <laughs> the woman who said 12, then how many lives did Iron Dome save? At most. At most five. In fact, it didn't even say five. Because between 2008-9 and 2014, Israel significantly improved its civil shelter system. It invested a lot of money in the shelters. The five lives that were saved were not because of Iron Dome. It was because of a more sophisticated shelter system. Iron Dome didn't say to anyone. It's just a complete myth about Iron Dome. The fact of the matter is, just give me one half second, the fact of the matter is, probably the top, or one of the best, I don't want to say the best, one of the best anti-missile defense system experts in the world is a fellow named Theodore Postel at MIT. All of you know MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, one of the top schools in the world, and one of the top experts is a person named Theodore Postel. He studied all the evidence, looked carefully. He said the effectiveness rate of Iron Dome, the effectiveness rate was at most, at most, 10%. He said, all this talk about 80% effectiveness, it's just propaganda because Israel wants to sell its technology <clears throat> to the stupid Saudis in the Gulf. <laughs> so they make up numbers and they know the Saudis are too dumb to figure out whether the numbers are true or not and they're going to spend billions of dollars on Iron Dome. But he said it didn't work. Now, do the math again. You have, which of course the Saudis can't do, <laughs> you have 4,000 rockets, 10% effectiveness, 400 are actually disabled by Iron Dome. That leaves 3,600 rockets. Now, here's the question. If 3,600 rockets made it safely into Israel, how could you have only $15 million in property damage? Rock, excuse me, schools don't go into shelters. Businesses don't go into shelters. Office buildings don't go into shelters. If you have 3,600 rockets hitting Israel, and you only have $15 million in property damage, there's only one possible logical conclusion. And what's the only possible logical conclusion? The housing market crash. Those aren't rockets. They're fireworks. <laughs> but it's true. Otherwise, tell me how you can only have $15 million in property damage. This building, I repeat, if it were hit by a rocket, would cost $15 million in property damage in part because everything in Turkey is so expensive, but we'll leave that aside. It'd be $15 million. What happened was Hamas and Israel, they had a common interest in claiming they were rockets. Israel said they were rockets, so we can claim we are acting in self-defense. Hamas said they were rockets, because they wanted to prove that armed resistance works, that they are defeating the Israelis. 
So strangely, both of them have a common interest in maintaining in keeping this myth of Hamas rockets. The attack ends, or the, the ground invasion ends, on August 3rd. Basically what happened was Israel started to target all of these United Nations facilities. They were attacking the UN schools and most of the United Nations facilities, which had been turned into shelters for civilians. Israel attacks one UN facility, two UN buildings, three UN buildings, four UN buildings, and now the pressure is beginning to increase to escalate on Ban Ki-moon, that corpse who is the head of the United Nations. And the people in the UN start saying, Ban Ki-moon, why aren't you doing anything? They are attacking United Nations buildings. They are killing United Nations personnel. Why aren't you doing anything? He stays silent, he stays silent, he stays silent because he's a puppet of the United States, a brain-dead puppet of the United States. But then on August 3rd, Israel attacks the 6th UN building. Finally, Ban Ki-moon has to say something and he called it a moral outrage and a criminal act. After Ban Ki-moon, the U.S. puppet finally says something. Now Obama is isolated in the world. Even Ban Ki-moon, that corpse, has risen from the dead and he's saying something. Obama is isolated and so on August 3rd, the same day that 6th UN shelter is attacked, the same day Ban Ki-moon finally says something. On August 3rd, the United States, now isolated in the world, finally says something. It says that what Israel did was disgraceful. And on that very same day, August 3rd, Israel announces the ground invasion is over. Uh, there's an important lesson there, namely, if you can isolate the United States internationally, even losing the support of the UN, you can get the United States to finally do something. It's hard, but finally the US had to say the invasion is over, and Netanyahu withdraws. Unfortunately, the war does not end at that point. The negotiations begin to end it. And at that moment, most of you will remember, the United States reporter was beheaded by ISIS. And now the attention again shifted from Gaza to ISIS the reporter's beheading, and Israel had another opportunity. And by the end, it was almost like a computer game. Israel was targeting one high-rise building after another, and just blowing up one apartment building after another. Amnesty International issued a report about two weeks ago, saying these were clearly war crimes. Israel didn't even pretend it had an excuse. It just was destroying everything in sight to try to force Hamas to give in. At the end, in my opinion, neither side won. 
Israel's aim was to destroy Hamas. It was unsuccessful. Israel's aim was to end any negotiations between the U.S. and the new government of the Palestinians. At the end, Israel was negotiating with Hamas. It started the attack because the U.S. and the EU were negotiating with Hamas. By the end, Israel itself was forced to negotiate with Hamas to end the attack. Um, Hamas was not defeated militarily or politically, but on the other hand, it has to be said that Hamas did not win anything politically. As all of you know, as Turkish people know in particular, the main goal of Hamas has been, since 2006, to end that illegal, immoral, and inhuman blockade of Gaza. After the 2008-9 attack on Gaza, the blockade was supposed to end. It did not end. After the attack on the Mahdi Marmara, some of you will remember, the international community <coughs> said the blockade has to be lifted, the situation can't continue this way, but the blockade wasn't lifted. After 2012, what was called Operation Pillar of Defense, one of the terms for ending the attack was supposed to be the blockade to be lifted, it was not lifted. And after the last attack, you might recall, Hamas claimed a political victory, the blockade would be lifted, but as of this moment, I'm sure everyone in this room knows, the blockade has not been lifted. And then you have to make a rational, a rational conclusion and to me, the rational conclusion is this. Hamas has the right, or the Palestinian people have the right, under international law, to use armed force to end the occupation. That, to me, is an uncontroversial, indisputable fact. They have the right to use armed force to end the occupation. But then there's a separate question. Is it a smart strategy? Is it working? I think all the evidence shows it's not working. The blockade is still there. There is no evidence that these rockets or tunnels are going, to, are going to force Israel to change its policy. On the other hand, it's also true that the strategy of the Palestinian Authority, namely diplomacy, and for Palestinian, the Palestinian Authority, diplomacy basically means begging the United States to put pressure on Israel to end the occupation. I think it's obvious at this point diplomacy is not going to work. The United States will never, on its own, put enough pressure on Israel to withdraw. It's not going to happen. We saw it in the past week. A lot of pressure built, escalated in Europe to get Israel to finally end the occupation. And when it went to the United Nations, the UN resolution, and this is in the last two days, I'm talking about yesterday and today, the US said, we're not going, we're going to veto the resolution. You'll never get the United States to put enough pressure on Israel 
to end the occupation if you just rely on begging. It's not going to happen. So I conclude armed resistance, you have the right to it, but it's not a effective strategy. It is not working. Yes, you killed 66 Israeli soldiers. But remember, in order for you to achieve 66 Israeli soldiers dead, your side lost 500 children, 1,500 civilians, and all of Gaza was destroyed. In order to, in order to militarily defeat Israel, there will be nothing left in Gaza. There's nothing left now. You achieve 66 combatant deaths. If you want to militarily defeat Israel, you're going to need maybe 600 combatant deaths. That's how many Israeli soldiers were killed before Israel withdrew from South Lebanon. It was about 600. Israel withdrew from the Egyptian Sinai after Egypt in the 1973 war killed between two and 3,000 Israeli soldiers. It was a major disaster for Israel. So before 66 reaches 600, which is how many Israeli soldiers died in South Lebanon, well, you do the math yourself. There will be nothing left in Gaza. There's barely anything left now in Gaza. That strategy just doesn't work. And the diplomacy strategy doesn't work. And so the question is, what can work? How can we finally end the conflict? And in my opinion, I won't have time now to discuss it because I want to hear from you. The only strategy, in my opinion, that can work is mass nonviolent civil resistance by the Palestinians combined with international solidarity around the world. If you put those two together, mass nonviolent resistance in the occupied territories, so Israel has no excuse. We're trying to protect ourselves from rockets. We're trying to protect ourselves from terror tunnels. If Israel has no excuse, and we here in the West show the courage of the people, for example, on the Mahdi Mamara, and that was genuine courage, I think if you combine the two, it would take me time to give you a detailed picture, and I don't want to do that now because I want to hear from you. But I think that strategy, which Palestinians tested for the first time during the first Palestinian Intifada in 1987, I think that strategy has real possibilities for achieving a reasonably just settlement. Pretty much what happened on August 3rd. You so isolate the United States, so embarrass the United States in the eyes of the world that the U.S. is forced against its will to tell Israel it has to stop. And I think mass nonviolent civil resistance where Israel has no excuses for using mass violence and the support inside the United Nations among people in the world, uh, I think it has a reasonable chance of success. Otherwise, it's hopeless. It is hopeless to pursue these strategies. It just, in the case of the armed resistance, just bring more death and destruction I'm not blaming Hamas. I'm perfectly aware Israel provoked the attacks. But the bottom line is, at the end, 
there's just more death and destruction. And if you continue with the strategy of diplomacy, the United States will do nothing, and Israel will just slowly but surely build more settlements until there's no less bank left. Those strategies have no possibility at all, which is, by the way, why the Palestinian Authority is so desperate now, because it realizes if it can't get a resolution, it, in effect, is telling the Palestinian people this strategy is a dead end. It's going nowhere. If you can't even get a lousy resolution from the UN after all the death and destruction in Gaza in the summer, after all the support from the European <coughs> governments, um, and after having in Israel a complete lunatic, a madman, an insane man as your prime minister, and still you can't get a lousy resolution, then it shows the begging from the United States. It's hopeless. And they're afraid it will reveal the whole strategy for the last 20 years. It's a joke. So those two strategies won't go anywhere. The one that might work, I think, uh, is the mass nonviolent civil resistance. Okay, thank you. I think what we'll do is as follows. Let me begin with people just asking me specific questions about what I said. And after four or five specific questions, then we can talk about whatever you like, except crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask something. You, you can stand up so I don't hear you. He has you six system. I have a Okay. Uh, I was going to ask uh, something that you did ask in five minutes. But, uh, my question was, as an American, and seeing you know, your Congress is finding it hard to pass anything, saying, well, we want to fund our government for the next year, you know, passing any sort of money bills, when will the US stop giving huge amounts of its treasure to Israel to buy weapons that you know, America isn't is essentially giving them for free. When will America stop doing this? Like they can't afford to continue this like money giving scenario. Yet they do. No, I don't think it's true to say the Americans can't afford. I mean, we have to be realistic about these things. The Americans give the Israel, yes, it's true, more than any other country in the world per per person. And Israel needs the money, you know, as much as uh, the Saudi Arabian um, sheikhs need the money. It's a rich country. But we're only really talking about $3 billion. Yeah. That's how much the U.S. gives Israel. What's $3 billion? The last mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, he was worth about 12, I think, a billion dollars. So it's just not, from the American point of view, it's just not that much money. You're not going to win over Americans on the issue of money. What you will win them over on is Israel is behaving in an atrocious and a horrible way. But the way you can win them over on that, I think, is by giving <coughs> Israel no excuses to carry out its massacres. Uh, so you have to try that nonviolent resistance, even though many people will get killed. The Palestinians, I know that. I think the Palestinians will be get, get killed if they try the nonviolent civil resistance. So I can't tell them to get killed. I can only say if you are willing to get killed, if you are willing, I am not, but if you are willing, then at least get killed for a strategy that might work. This, these massacres of Gaza, they are not budging Israel. So, but I don't think the money is going to, is going to, it's just not significant uh, from the American point of view, that kind of money. Yes? Uh, 
don't know how well you've been following the latest developments regarding the discovery of natural gas in the eastern Mediterranean, but I mean, you have been following, you'd be aware that um, at the moment Israel is forming a coalition, diplomatic coalition with um, Davis, uh, Greece, um, Cyprus, and Egypt, and they're talking about piping the gas to Europe, uh, which is looking to diversify, diversify away from Russia anyway. Um, but many experts are saying that this is not possible without turning Turkey into an energy hub, because um, you know, without what? Without turning Turkey into an energy hub, because the project just doesn't seem feasible because of the depths of the sea and the seas. Mm -hmm. I don't know the technical points. I'm listening yeah. to you. Go ahead. Um, well, that's what the experts are saying. Mm -hmm. Expert myself. Um, but basically, um, experts are trying to pressure um, Turkey and Israel to work together um, so that a feasible pipe pipeline can go from the eastern Mediterranean and um, from Israel's reserves through Turkey into Europe. Um, do you believe that this agreement is possible? And if it is possible, do you think that um, Turkey could use its political leverage to um, end the blockade in Gaza? No, I mean, we have to be honest about these things. Israel's military cooperation with Turkey has increased <laughs> since the Mahdi Marmara. Israel's economic relations with Turkey has increased. Uh, politics can sometimes be separate from military and, and economic issues. And the Turkish government, on a political level, can be, at times, pretty tough on Israel while at the same time, on the military and economic level, things actually improve. I'm not blaming Turkey. The same thing happens in the US. So everybody knows the US has now, at a political level, there's a lot of dislike between Mr. Obama and Mr. Netanyahu. They don't like each other. In fact, I'm sure Obama hates Netanyahu, because in, in part because Netanyahu is such a racist. He would never carry on that way with a white person. It's not possible. He would never talk that way to Bush. Because Bush would say, who the F are you talking to? I'm the President of the United States. But he's such a racist, he carries on that way with Obama. So there's no love lost between the two. But economically and militarily, the relations have improved a lot under Obama. When Obama says security relations between Israel and the United States have never been better than now, it's factually true. Economically, never better than now. Militarily, never better than now. But politically, there's a lot of hostility. And the same thing is true with Turkey. Politically, yes, there's a lot of hostility because uh, Netanyahu is such a racist. In his mind, Turks are just more stupid Arabs. That's how he sees it. It's just the stupid Muslims and stupid, and he carries on like Turkey doesn't count. And Erdogan, whatever you, Erdogan, whatever you say about him, he has a certain desire to create a proud Turkey. And so he takes personal offense. And so, like with Obama, there's no love loss between the two. But economically, the pipeline, they'll work together. They will. I, I, I don't see any uh, significant possibility they won't. It just won't be publicized. It will be done quietly. That's politics, it's ugly. Yes? Um, it's an honor to share my idea here uh, with you. Maybe if you could stand up because there are people in the back. Um, I have a question. You said we don't have to give excuse to Israel, but uh, in 2008-9 and 2014, they have a point, they are point A, and they want to go point B, and point B is for them, Gaza or West Bank, militarily, and I, I think those three, uh, those three Israeli people, which was kidnapped, and it was just, it's, it was an excuse, but it's not hard to, I don't believe in coincidence, especially when it's related to Netanyahu, so it's easy to find excuses, 
We just have to produce a problem, um, produce a problem, then wait for the reaction, and then uh, serve them the solution. We we call this um, problem reaction, uh, reaction Actually, solution. Reaction. Yeah. yeah. Um, you're is you're it, is totally it? right. Uh, I I'm not gonna. I never argue with facts. He said. When you want to create an excuse, it's not hard to create an excuse. So, as I said, Netanyahu was so angry that the U.S. and the EU were ignoring him when he said, don't negotiate with Hamas. And that's after the U.S. and EU were negotiating with Iran. And he was angry, angry. He was looking for an excuse. And he finally found it, because as you say, it's not difficult to find an excuse. He found it in the three Israeli teenagers. I think that's all true. And then you need an extremely disciplined leadership who says, don't take the bait. Resist their provocation. So let me give you an example. Let's take the case of the Hezbollah. As you know, Israel has carried on many operations to try to provoke the Hezbollah. They killed several people in leadership positions. They blew up several Hezbollah buildings. They're trying to provoke the Hezbollah. But each time, Syed uh, Nasrava, he says, we will settle this, but when we decide, not when you decide. And he holds back. He holds back. He has a disciplined organization. He says, we will remember, we will get our revenge, but we're not going to do it when you want us to do it. So it's true that you can always find a provocation. But you have to also remember, it's also possible to find the inner discipline to resist the occupation. During the first Israeli Intifada, for example, in the first year, 1987 to 88, Israel killed 132 Palestinians in Gaza. 132 uh, people in Gaza. How many people did Gaza kill among the Israelis? You know what the answer is? Zero. They found it in them to hold back because they knew exactly what you said. The moment we respond is we will have its excuse and then it will fire away and kill everybody in sight. So I'm not going to dispute what you said but I think there are ways of, if you can find it in you, and it's not easy, it's not easy if you can find it in you to be, to resist the provocations. If I might just make a point here, uh, my publisher, my Turkish publisher is here. He came as a surprise. Do you want to just stand up? Um, and he uh, just published a book of mine, a large part of which is about the Mavi Marmara and what happened afterwards. Uh, but uh, his, next, his next publication uh, is a book I wrote about uh, Gandhi. And Gandhi always argued it takes a lot more courage to be non-violent than violent. And you will be surprised, many of you, I think, to learn Gandhi's main value, the thing that was most important to him, it was not non-violence. No, it was not. The most important value to Gandhi was courage. The thing he hated most was cowardice. So, you might ask the question, if Gandhi valued courage 
more than any value, how could he say nonviolence is more courageous than violence? It doesn't seem to be true. Most people think being violent, taking up a weapon, it requires more courage than nonviolence. The problem is most people don't understand what Gandhi meant by nonviolence. What Gandhi meant was the following, if I could just give you an example. He says, let's imagine this person and this person, stand up if you don't mind, just stand up. You two are on the battlefield and you're facing each other, okay? <laughs> each of you has a rifle. He has a weapon, he has a weapon. At the end of the exchange of bullets, one of them will be dead, one of them will be alive. So each of them has a 50-50 chance of living. If you're violent, if you have a weapon. What did Gandhi mean by nonviolence? Gandhi said nonviolence requires that you march into the line of fire, he said, smilingly and cheerfully, and get yourself blown to bits. That's what nonviolence is for Gandhi. You're supposed to get yourself killed. Because he said, unless you get yourself killed, you're not going to get people's sympathy. People, the nature of people is they only care about a just cause if you get yourself killed. And Gandhi said, if you want to be a follower of mine, you have to get yourself killed. That's what nonviolence is about. So I say to you, it takes a lot more courage to find the inner discipline not to be provoked. But Gandhi believed if the public, the broad public, sees that even in the face of provocations, even when you get killed for a just cause, he said the broad public will finally come to support you. And, you know, a case is what happened with the Mahdi Marmara. It was a very interesting thing that happened. The day after nine nonviolent people were killed, all of a sudden all the world leaders said, this blockade can't continue. The blockade has to end. All of a sudden, they discovered it. They discovered it, I think, because of what Gandhi said. If you have a just cause, and you find the strength to get killed, then you have a possibility of winning public opinion on your side. But if they didn't get killed, Nobody would have paid attention to the blockade. They only suddenly discovered the blockade when non nonviolent people were killed. That's what people are like. Actually, the blockade, the nine, well, the nine Turkish citizens who were killed on the blockade, they got more world sympathy for the siege than the 2,200 Palestinians who were killed this summer. How many people said at the end of the attack on Gaza this summer that the blockade had to end? Really not many. More people said it after the Mahdi Marmara. And I think it's because they managed to stay not violent. I think that's just factually the case. There was very little sympathy for ending the blockade. The whole thing is forgotten already. And the blockade continues. So 
I, 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 I'm not going to say it's easy, and I probably couldn't do it personally. No, I'm sure I couldn't do it personally, but I think it's the only thing that can work. Bearing in mind Gandhi's, Gandhi's belief, uh, his belief was anything you can achieve <coughs> violently, you can also achieve non-violently with less death and destruction. There's going to be death. There's going to be destruction. But he said, I think you can achieve the same political goal non-violently with less death and destruction. But there's going to be death and there's going to be destruction. There's just, that's the way the world works. Yes? Actually, I have three questions to ask you. Maybe if you could stand. Uh, yeah. I have three questions, but I want to ask you. Uh, first, uh, just one question, because uh, the others are not so important uh, here this question. And uh, actually, there is some speculation between very strict Zionist people, I mean, strict Zionist writers, that Israel has an idea to preach in the territories of Egypt, in the territories of um, Lebanon, 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 okay? I'm, I'm not really good at uh, pronouncing the. I'm struggling, I'm struggling with auto one. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to name, mention your prime minister and everyone looks <laughs> okay. and, um, do you think that uh, this idea is realistic to, to create a very Israeli country no. in the world and be the one the, Country, I mean, very big country. No. Or is, is this unrealistic or very strict nationalistic? Or do you think that these, all these wars and all these massacres in Palestine is serving this, serving to this idea? No, because, you know, the international community is pretty tough on this issue that you can't change borders by war. They don't like that idea because every country then can lose its country. So on that particular issue, they're pretty tough. You have to remember, Israel is a pretty small place. We know that, right? And the amount of territory they actually want in the West Bank, they want about 10% of the territory, uh, what they call the major settlement blocks. And the international community is actually giving them a pretty hard time on that. They're not stopping them because of the United States. But they're not letting them freely go either. Uh, it's so it's not realistic yeah. in the modern world. It's yeah. just not going to happen. You know, Israel wants to control other ways. You know, it's economic power. Uh, it's uh, military power. It wants to control in other ways. But I don't think it wants to control by changing the border. It, it's had too much negative experience. It tried to change the border of Egypt. What happened? They had the 1973 war. They lost 3,000 soldiers. They tried to change the border in South Lebanon because people said they wanted the water from the Latani. Also, go on heights. Go on heights. Uh, un uh, unfortunately, most of the world doesn't care about it. Uh, it just. It's not like they accept Israel's annexation, but most of the world doesn't really care. It just doesn't seem significant enough. Yeah. But if they tried, for example, to take a piece of Lebanon again, it's impossible. First of all, they would have a hard time with the party of God. They would have a very hard time. And the Lebanese won't accept it. It's like trying to take a part of Turkey. You know, the Israelis decide they want the part of Turkey. They, they're not getting it. It's not going to happen. Actually, this idea uh, comes from, I mean, I just, it's just some speculation with the very Zionist writers, and they say that um, Israeli people are uh, holy people, and they will be the last nation before doomsday. So, all the world will be ours, so whatever we are doing, or killing people, blah, 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 no. they, it's not a sin, it's our right to kill people, because we are holy, and we are up on all the nations, so no, it's no. just... Israelis are not nearly so irrational as you might think. 
Uh, Netanyahu does what he does because he actually can get away with it. He has enough different kinds of power. He is able to get away with it. But the moment he realizes he doesn't have the power, if, for example, enough pressure is put on him, he'll withdraw. The last crazy Israeli leader was Menachem Begin, who was considered a complete nut. But he withdrew from the Sinai. After Israel lost two to 3,000 soldiers in 1973,